And so I'd like to welcome everyone to today's panel event, um, Tech in the Service of Displaced People, the first event of the Bannon Forum for the year, um, and the first event for our new theme, Tech in the Human Spirit. Um, and my name is Aaron Willis. I'm the director of the Bannon Forum and the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara University. Um, and this is, again, the first name for our newly renamed Bannon Forum. And the, worst of you, the use of the word forum indicates um, our signal, our signals our vision for the future of our programming, and that is fostering a conversation on campus and beyond about the pressing contemporary issues um, of society globally. And what we're trying to do is bring the over 500 years, or almost 500 years of Ignatian Jesuit intellectual tradition to bear on these contemporary problems, and using that tradition to help us better understand how we can address these concerns. Um, and so we're going to illuminate and activate our institutional mission here on campus in Silicon Valley and beyond. Um, the other thing we're launching today is our new theme, Tech and the Human Spirit. And this event exemplifies a kind of motivating question behind this new initiative. And that is, how can we shepherd technological innovation in a way that leads to human flourishing and a flourishing for all of humanity? Right. That People on the margins are also included in this vision of what technology can do uh, for humanity, right? And so through the use of the Jesuit worldview, um, we hope to examine how technology is changing what it means to be human, how we understand ourselves, and how it's changed in the way we interact and understand each other, right? Um, and we have placed a one-page sheet on, the, on all of your tables at your seat where hopefully you can learn more about our new initiative and we hope that you will continue to take part in this conversation over the next two years, that you will go to our website, see future events, and continue to be involved um, in this conversation as we move forward. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Father Dorian Llewellyn, who is the director of the Nation Center for Jesuit Education. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, can I also repeat the welcome to you? Um, I also say, want to say a big thank you to our panelists who I'm going to introduce right now. Um, I also want to thank very much the people who are here, especially our, for our friends from the Miller Center. Um, we have a great colleagueship with them, and uh, we've come to realize that we are very much more than the sum of our, uh, of our parts together. So together, we do this, and it's we are centers of distinction, which makes Santa Clara distinctive and distinct, and it makes us more who we are. So um, with that, let me introduce uh, our four panelists today, and I'm going to go from, uh, from your right to the left. No political comments there. Um, uh, and these are the order of our speakers. So first of all, um, uh, Professor Banji Abriel. Um, Professor Gabriel joined the legal research analysis and writing faculty here uh, at the law School of Law in 2003. She directed the program from 2017 to 14. So in addition to currently teaching those areas and advocacy, she also directs the Immigration Appellate Practice Clinic and the Law School's Summer Legal Studies Program in Sydney. She speaks and writes regularly on immigration law, particularly on immigration relief for refugees and victims of abuse and crime. Before she came to us, she taught at Notre Dame University School of Law in Perth, um, and she also served as a consultant to the Murdoch University Law School. Uh, when she came back she has, uh, to the state, she was a senior attorney with the Catholic Legal Immigration Network in San Francisco. She also served 16 years as clinical law faculty at Loyola, New Orleans, where she practiced law with her students in the areas of immigration, juvenile, domestic, and federal civil rights law. She directed the street law program, the summer legal program in Mexico, and the mobile immigration law clinic. Uh, next, we have Dr. Silvia Figueira, who has degrees in computer science from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and she has a PhD also in computer science from UC San Diego. Currently, she also serves as faculty. She's an associate prof professor of computer engineering here, where she researches in the area of performance evaluation and prediction with an emphasis on energy efficiency. 
Here she also directs, many of you would know her as the director of the Frugal Innovation Hub. She leads the Mobile Lab and advises students working on mobile applications for underserved communities and emerging markets. Um, she has published an impressive 70 papers and established several collaborations with companies here in the Valley and social entrepreneurs in the States and abroad. Uh, moving on, we have our two uh, representatives from Leaf Global Fintech, and they will tell you more about that. Um, Nat Robinson is one of the two co-founders. Prior to establishing Leaf, um, he spent seven years as the founder and CEO of Juhudu Kilimo Company Limited, which provides micro-asset financing to rural smallholder farmers in Kenya. He comes originally from Colorado, and he has traveled, work, and studies in over 60 countries in business, nonprofits, and government. Um, he is the author of a book called Creating a Cash Cow in Kenya, and he has presented at a number of places, the Stanford Graduate School of Business, Harvard Business School, the Wharton School, Columbia Business School, Vanderbilt Graduate School of Management, and also for the United Nations Development Program. And then finally, also another co the other co-founder of LEAF is Tori Samples, uh, who comes, uh, she also too has, like Nat, has an MBA from Val Vanderbilt. She brings to us a background in technology and 15 years of experience working with refugees. Um, HCA Healthcare is the leading for-profit, uh, not-for-profit of provider of healthcare in the US. As a data architect there, Tori designed and developed some of the largest data sets in the world. Uh, she has also worked in data care delivery settings across the world, including HIV cli AIDS clinics in Tanzania and the emergency department of a 60, 150 bed hospital here in the States. I want to shine a light on uh, the fact that LEAF is part of the Miller Center's current social entrepreneurship at the margins cohort. Um, breaking news is that LEAF has been named a top company in the Vatican's 2018 Laudato Si challenge, which asks companies to sustainably improve the lives of 10 million people excluded from our common home by 2020 through sustainable and ethical business. Uh, later on at the end of the program, I'm going to issue you two invitations um, to two wonderful Miller events in connection with their accelerator program social entrepreneurship at the margins, but you haven't come here to listen to me, you've come to listen to other people. So uh, welcome to our panelists, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Father Dorian, and thanks so much to the Bannon Forum and to Aaron Willis for organizing this panel. Um, I'm, and thanks to all of you for being here. I'm so honored to be a part of this, of this distinguished panel. Um, so I am the non-tech person in the room. I'm an immigration lawyer and I represent asylum seekers in the United States and um, asylum seekers in the United States and I also write and teach in the area of refugee law. So my job today is to tell you a little bit about who displaced people are and get us thinking about what their needs are and how tech might respond to those needs. Um, you can pick up a newspaper any day and see a, a lot of news about uh, displaced people and refugee situations, but I wanted to highlight three that make our um, discussion today especially relevant. And one of them is um, uh, Pope Francis's canonization on Sunday of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador, who was murdered during the Salvadoran Civil War that sent so many Salvadorans fleeing to the United States. Um, a second one is the um, migrant march that is progressing from Honduras as we speak. And a third is the arrival in the United States 33 years ago today of a refugee named Albert Einstein. So we have a very topical topic to, to, to discuss today. Let's see. So um, the first shocking thing about displaced people is really the numbers of them. So the, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that there are 68.5 million people of interest to the UNHCR, and then those are categorized into different uh, types of, of individuals. The, the biggest one is displaced, is internally displaced people. So these are people that are 
um, still within their countries, but have been forced to flee from their normal residences by um, all sorts of things, civil war or, dis or economic um, problems or environmental disasters, a, a, a number of, of causes. Um, the second are refugees who are defined very specifically under international law in two documents, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees and the 1967 Protocol to that Convention. And they, the, the, those define refugees as people who are outside their country of nationality and are afraid to return um, because of persecution or well, um, persecution on account of one of five protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, then there are also asylum seekers, so people who are, are um, in a country that has an asylum processing system like the United States and are seeking uh, asylum there. And then finally there are, display, uh, there are stateless people who um, are without any legal nationality. Um, that might be because they were born in a country that requires that your parents be citizens in order for you to have citizenship, or maybe because your nationality was removed uh, from a change in country's borders or a change in national laws. So, so, um, 85% of refugees are housed not in, um, in countries like the United States, but in developing countries. So the, 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 you can see here the f countries, the five countries that hold, that, that house the greatest number of refugees around the world. And many of them are stressed with their own problems, civil strife or, or war themselves or, or, or um, famine or drought or some other sort of, of environmental disaster. So the stress of housing these refugees um, adds to the stress that those countries may already be feeling. I mean, the, the, um, the housing of refugees goes on for years and, and sometimes for generations. Um, the, you, the United Nations uh, goal is for a durable solution for refugees, which could be um, repatriation or it could be resettlement in, um, in a country of first refuge or it could be resettlement in a third country. But it's hard to arrange those resettlements in a third country. They take a long time and you've got a lot of compassion fatigue. The United States is one of the countries that resettles refugees from abroad, but we have reduced the number of refugees that we will take. Um, the, normally, we've, in the past few years, we've been taking about an average of, of 80,000 or at least um, uh, um, set 80,000 as our target, although not all always make it to the United States. But this year, our numbers are reduced so that the United States will be accepting only 30,000 refugees from abroad. Um, Fifty-seven percent of, of refugees come from just three countries. Those aren't the only refugee producing countries, but those are the ones that produce, that have produced the most refugees over the past um, series of years. And um, the causes of refugee flows um, are, are varied. There, there, there is um, ethnic tension or civil unrest foreign aggression. Um, more and more there are environmental disasters, um, sometimes uh, accelerated or, or exacerbated by climate changes. There's, sometimes there's just pure poverty and no way to, to, to earn a living. Um, so there, there's a varied um, list of reasons why people feel compelled to, to leave their countries. And I have a somewhat grainy map of where, uh, of, the, of the refugee producing um, areas of the world. Um, so you can see um, where the, the most of those most of those people come from. Um, if we're thinking about in you know on our own home ground, maybe the most um, representative face of refugees is the um, the unaccompanied children who come to our borders. You know this year alone, um, as of August of this year. Um, the, immigration and, uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or the Border Patrol, had apprehended 45,704 young people, so uh, people under the age of 18 coming unaccompanied to the borders. Um, and you can see the trend here. This, this started in about 2011, 
and we have increasing numbers. Um, these are, and these children are coming from what's called the Northern Triangle of Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. We also have, we've always had Mexicans um, coming across the border as well, but this uh, increase in the number of children from, the, from um, Central America has increased in the last few years. It looked like there might have been a lull in 2016, but we're, our numbers have started to go up again. And um, for this year, for fiscal year 2018, we're already at that 45,000 mark. Um, so I wanted to tell you um, some, uh, some stories about some refugees or people at least seeking asylum. So here's the first one. And this, this is not the actual picture of the person I'm going to tell you about, but this picture is evocative of that person. Um, his name was Kevin. He's 15. And he came from Honduras with his little brother, Stephen, who was 13. So in Honduras, the um, MS-13 gang targeted Kevin because he was starting to look strong. And they um, forced him to join the gang. And they tried to get him to do you know, criminal acts um, on behalf of the gang. And these included some um, requests that he do violent actions, including killing people. And he refused, and he was brutally beaten because of his refusal. And then the gang started uh, to recruit his little brother, Stephen, because Stephen was starting to mature as well. So at this point, the, um, Kevin's mother was already in the United States. He didn't know his father because um, the father, he had been estranged from the father. The father had been abusive to the mother. Um, and so he thought he had no option but to take Stephen and make their way to the United States. And um, it was a, a, a really difficult journey. They, um, they, they had to, part of their trip was on La Bestia, a train that um, goes through Mexico and um, that many migrants ride. Um, they had to trek through the desert and thought they might not make it there with the, with, because of lack of water. But they eventually made it to the United States and, um, in, and into um, a migrant children's shelter. And this is uh, one of them. This is the, the, um, San Padre, um, the Casa Padre run by Southwest Key in San Benito, Texas. And it looks, you know, it looks pretty nice from the, from the curbside, but it's actually you know, quite locked up. The, the kids in there are, are fed and housed, and they're given some education, but they're under lock and key. You know, they have no real freedom to, to move. Um, so, and as of September of this year, the um, U.S. was detaining um, 12,800 children. So we, we, um, we detain a lot of, of these unaccompanied minors. And so um, the refugee's journey is often physically um, difficult, physically dangerous, and, and emotionally traumatic. It, this is the a picture of La Bestia, the train that goes through Mexico. Your, the refugee's journey could also involve um, being on a boat, an overladen boat, in, in, in rickety condition and in danger of drowning. Um, it could also include, you know, trekking across the desert without water and without um, landmarks. So this is the next story I wanted to tell you about. This is about um, Irene, who, is, who lives in the Dadaab um, refugee camp in Kenya. Um, and he's lived there since he was 10. He's mar he married in the camp, and he, had, he and his wife have two children. Um, he, um, at one point, it, Kenya decided they would close the camp in 2016. And so um, Irene um, took his family and decided they would try to repatriate to his native Somalia. And he took the $400 that the UNHCR gave him for repatriation um, and left, for, left the camp. And he had gone about 50 miles when he was um, stopped by armed militia and um, beaten, ro robbed of the little bit that he had, and, um, and kidnapped eventually managed to escape and made it back to Dadaab. So the, the problems there are that there's not enough electricity, so the parts of the camp are, are dark. Um, the Al-Shabaab militia um, comes to the camp to recruit soldiers and workers. Um, there are no jobs except for the people who um, managed to get a job with an aid agency there, although there is great entrepreneurial uh, activity and people start their own businesses from bakeries to cinemas. Um, their, the education is s um, somewhat rudimentary, not enough school houses and not enough um, books and paper, but um, there are generations living, living in this camp. 
it houses right now about over 200,000 people, which is down from what it, it it's not, not as big now as it used to be. And then um, my last story is about Fatima, who is from Syria. She lost her hands when she was 12 and an explosion occurred in, um, near her house. She and her mother made it to the Al Zatari refugee camp in, um, in Jordan, um, where they now live. So I would like to leave you um, with three questions and then turn it over to the, um, to the experts. Oh, and my three questions slide is not up there, so I'll just have to ask you the three questions. So the first one is, what can tech do to help these individuals as, as individuals? What can tech do to help the countries of first refuge, which are struggling under the burden of hosting so many, um, so many um, refugees? And third, what can tech do to help stop the refugee flows from the outset? Some, what can be done to improve conditions in countries so that we don't have these refugee flows? So with that, um, doing the, having done the light lifting, I'll turn it over to the experts. <laughs> Am I next? Okay. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Silvia Figueira, and I'm a professor in computer engineering, and I direct the Frogo Innovation Hub. Well, and my job as the director of the Frugal Hub is to connect uh, the students and faculty with real needs. So we basically form groups of students to work on projects in, in different places, in other countries, in, in unserved communities, and sometimes in rural areas or sometimes here in the Bay Area, and we have worked with homeless people, and we are now looking into this whole problem of you know, refugees. So as, you know, my, I guess I have two jobs, a prof being a professor and the director of the hub, and there is a place where these two jobs actually kind of, you know, meet, meet with where I, I devise a lot of the mobile projects for social benefits. So my students, the computer engineering students, develop lots of applications that can, can help underserved communities. So this is where my two jobs actually kind of get, meet in the middle. So I, this is a big problem that, uh, Vinja just talked about, and we have been, you know, seeing this from the technology perspective, and, and that's my, my take on, on what is happening here. So technology is there, and it's already help, helping people, and it's being used all over the place. Somebody told me that the first question that people ask when they are, you know, displaced or, or arrive at a new place is, is there Wi-Fi here? Because they want to tell people, I got here, I made it, I, you know, it's okay, I'm safe. And it, so they already had a phone when they came or went or, or got, you know, moved. So technology is already part of everyone's life. People claim, I, it took me a while to understand that and agree with that or believe that, but everybody in the world pretty much has access to a, a, a cellular phone. Or, and, and, and these smartphones are making their way in, in, into lots of these places. So it's becoming a, a very technological world, and even in very impoverished areas, people actually have access. If they don't have their own, there is one in the house or there is one in the, in the community. So they have access to technology and that brings services and that brings information that actually was not there before. So technology is already helping in some ways, you know, different populations and that includes refugees as well. They already have a phone when they, when they move. So the phone is there and, and, the, and we, in our case, we are trying to enable them to use that to help them, to help them somehow. So either by you know, bringing information or by bringing services. So the phone is there. We're just helping the phone to help them in a more appropriate way. So my first question here is, OK, so there's technology you know, always help. And the problem is it, it doesn't. So it needs to be done the right way. It's not just you know, if you have a phone, the phone is you know, going to enable to solve the problems that actually Vinji talked about. It's not because you have a phone that you're going to have access to the right information. It's not because you have a phone that you're going to get a job that will enable you to do well in the place where you moved or in the place where you were coming from and, and then you don't need to move anymore. So to be able to make the technology help, we need to invest in writing you know, the right applications and, and use the technology in the right way. So with that in mind, 
you know, there are you know, three main situations that we, we learn that are part of this reality now. And, and okay, so sometimes technology does help. And so there are several examples of that. We implemented a, an application, for example, in, in our lab for homeless people here, which we didn't expect that to happen at all, but the organization that was deploying these for homeless people decided that that was actually very appropriate for refugees in Texas. So our application actually has been uploaded to funds that refugees have in Texas to help them find resources. That was not designed for that. We didn't even know, you know, it was the same problem, but, you know, refugees in, sometimes in the same way as homeless people here in the Bay Area have a hard time finding resources, have a hard time, you know, finding things that they need. So the application was meant for that. And there's another application that we, that we created for homeless people again, which is for, uh, it's an announcement tool because, you know, people here have a hard time reaching out to homeless people. So we wrote this application that basically enables organizations to send out annou announcements as SMS. And this one is also being used, you know, for refugees in Texas. So it was not planned like that, but suddenly, you know, the same application is helping this other community in, in the same way. So we also heard about applications that are being used to train people for jobs. So it's being used in Africa. and. It, it's interesting, it's a, such a coincidence that we were approached by the mayor's office, San Jose mayor's office, because they want to have one here too. So we have been looking into how do you write an application to help people be trained for jobs here so that they can actually you know, get a job and, and start a life in, in their new place. So we were approached by the mayor's office and we are working on that actually right now. But there are situations where application does not really help. So if you don't know what you're doing, you may write a whole application for a phone or for mobile devices or anything else for that matter. That will just not happen. If you don't understand what people need, it's really easy to actually follow the wrong path. So, and there's lots of situations and examples of that in, in, in the past uh, and, and currently as well. So one of them, you probably heard about that, you know, some time ago people decided to give away lots of laptops for all the kids in, in, in countries in Africa. And a lot of those never got used. So if you actually donate a lot of technology but you don't have the right application to go along with that, it's basically not going to be useful at all. So just donating sometimes even cellular phones for people, yeah, maybe they're going to be able to text and they're going to be able to in Facebook. But they, you know, it's not going to help them in any way, you know, practical, like not going to help them get a job and things like that. So it's really easy to actually, because we think we know what people's problems are, so it's really easy to kind of like take the wrong path here and, and do something that is totally useless. So uh, technology can help, but you have to write the right application and you have to understand what this is for. And the next one, which is even worse than that, is the fact that technology may actually hurt. And I know it sounds like, why? I mean, you have a phone, it doesn't do anything bad to you. Okay, it turns out, and, and it's kind of scary, that more than 90% of the information on the web is false. And I know we've been talking a lot about fake news and things like that, but, but there's a lot of, you know, just false information on the web. Now, if you think about if you're a refugee or you're a homeless person for that matter, and you don't have access to lots of, you know, uh, lots of sources of information beyond what comes from your phone, and you don't know what to trust, how do you know that that information is true? So this is a big problem, and over, I don't know if this is true or not, 90%, but I have friends on, you know, that work with information retrieval, and that's what they tell me, that there's a lot of information that is wrong. And you're probably thinking, no, there isn't. I mean, I read my news every day on, I don't know, CNN or whatever source. It's all true. Yeah, but you know what the, true, what the real sources are. Some people don't. If you Google something, there will be a lot of links to things that are totally, you know, false. And people, sometimes they don't know. If you are in another place, if you just moved to another country and you were, you know, placed in this, you know, situation, how do you know what to trust? How do you know what is true or not? So false information can actually hurt people. So there is a huge uh, work now towards coming up with ways to, to figure out how to provide, you know, information saying, geez, looks false on whenever you do a Google search for that matter. So this is a, a problem, you know, between implementing something or developing something that will enable technology to help people and avoid people to actually use false information, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done in that. So how do you do that? So that's my last slide, just, you know, to you know, keep you thinking about it. So we need to understand what people need to start with. So, you know, embracing empathy is a big deal for that. You need to actually 
work with local organizations so that they can actually tell you, so this is what people need, because it's hard for us to understand, right? I mean, false information is not a problem for most of us because you know where to go for your information. But for other people, it is a problem. So we need to understand what you know, these problems are. And usually, working with a local organization that actually help, help these people enable us to help them better. So most of the projects we do actually in our lab is basically helping the helper. We try to partner with some organization that is already helping and enable them to do it better. So I'm going to you know, leave that thought of, you know, about that with you. And I'm going to pass to my next <laughs> speaker here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these tough questions. I appreciate it. And thank you, Father Dorian, for the kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be back here. This is actually my second time through the Miller Center's GSBI program. So I'm a very big fan of what you have here on uh, campus and looking forward to continuing to um, stay in touch with, um, with Santa Clara. So uh, my name is Nat Robinson, and uh, Tori Samples and myself have started a company called Leaf Global FinTech. And to address some of these uh, challenges, as you can tell, it's a very big global crisis that is very complex. Um, and it was something that we both got interested in while we were students at uh, Vanderbilt University as uh, graduate students and uh, signed up for a pitch competition that was a global pitch competition that was asking for student business ideas to address the global refugee crisis. At some point in that, um, in that journey, in that spectrum. So from that experience, I think that's what got me very interested um, in this challenge and in this problem. Tori has the uh, refugee uh, experience and background. My background was working in East Africa and in microfinance. And I thought, well, there's got to be something that I can take from my background to bring to this, um, this challenge. And one of the ideas that we came up with in that uh, brainstorming session with some of our other students was this idea of moving cash uh, safely across borders. And we'll get more into that um, business model, but that was what we had worked on as students. So the students in the room, um, university is a great place to come up with business ideas. You're surrounded by resources and other students and faculty and space. So I would highly encourage you to, um, to do that. Uh, I think that was really helpful in getting us uh, going. But as you've heard, there's 68.5 million refugees uh, and displaced people around the world. And so think about what that's like to have to flee your country, just take everything that you have, carry it with you, you know, convert whatever you can, liquidate what you can into cash, and then carry that cash across a border where you can, as you heard from some of the stories, be robbed, be taken advantage of. And then when you get to that point of safety, then what do you do? Then you have to convert into a local currency. Maybe you can't get a job. It's a very, very difficult challenge. And so I think that was what really inspired us to, to address this and to start LEAF and to create a virtual bank for the stateless and excluded to help refugees to store and transport assets uh, across borders. And we've been working with a mobile uh, uh, mobile technology, mobile application that allows, uh, allows you to convert cash into stable investments. And we've been using blockchain technology. And our, uh, our system doesn't work on a smartphone. It's a feature phone, but it's essentially to allow refugees around the world to move cash uh, across those borders. And so in addition to the 68 million, 68.5 million refugees, there's another 100 million living in crisis and could be refugees at any time. So this is a crisis that unfortunately could only get worse, especially with, um, with climate change. And one of the challenges of working in some of these countries is that the banking systems and banking infrastructure is very limited, yet 60% are using mobile money. And this is similar to, to Venmo, what we have uh, here was prevalent in East Africa, where you can take cash, convert that into a, a mobile uh, digital form, and then use that to send uh, to friends and family or to use it to make purchases. So it's a great way for us to use that existing network and infrastructure to deliver our services. But one of the challenges with mobile money is it doesn't cross borders. So it's difficult to carry that over that, um, that border, but a great way to get in and out of cash. Um, and as I heard uh, earlier, my background is in, uh, is in East Africa and microfinance. And so as we were looking at places around the world to start, we looked at those same maps where you have high flows of refugees, but then also overlaid that with high flows of refugees. And that is where we focused in on East Africa, and in particular, uh, Congo. And on the, the border of Congo and Rwanda, where you have a high flow of refugees and um, heavy use of mobile money. 
So the way that the process works is that a refugee who's fleeing conflict, they take cash, convert that into mobile money, they cross that border without carrying cash, and we'll before then have gathered uh, biometric information to connect that individual to their account. So when they get to their point of safety, they can reconnect with those assets and then check their balance at any time through an SMS uh, interface or text interface. The other advantage of setting up this uh, essentially virtual wallet is that friends and family abroad can send money into that account so that it travels with that refugee so when they get to wherever they're, they're going, they can pull that cash down into that local currency or perhaps use it as collateral on a uh, microloan. And I'll have Tori share a bit about the uh, technology as that's her, that's her background. Um, so we're able to do a lot of our services because of blockchain technology, but I want to be very clear that um, our stance on this, with any new technology really, is that it serves a purpose, um, but no technology is going to save the world, and so we've been um, very particular in the use cases in which we've applied this technology with. Um, and so we use blockchain to store transactions and f to facilitate cross-border asset transfer. Not mentioned that we use biometrics to link identity across borders, um, but it's important to note there that we don't actually use the blockchain to store any customer identifiable information or cryptocurrency at all. Um, it's a great back-end solution for us because it makes our lives easier in terms of just having cheaper, faster transactions around the world and moving cash around, but um, a refugee is never going to hear the word blockchain. Uh, that's, that's not the space that we need to be in, and so matching that appropriate technology with the consumer base is really important for us. Uh, but what, what blockchain allows us to do is eliminate the need for trust between a lot of the partners and institutions that we work with and provide those faster, cheaper transactions for a population that demands high security. Um, and so we're, we're able to do that. Uh, that also helps differentiate us from some of our competition. Um, we are a for-profit business, and I think that a lot of times we get it's assumed that we're a nonprofit, but what we found is that having this for-profit business model, this revenue model behind it, actually helps differentiate us and establish trust with our customers. We get that question a lot of, well, why would, why would a refugee ever trust you with their money? And what we found in our research on the ground is that refugees actually trust a for-profit business because they understand the incentives. They're clear, right? I'm paying for a service. I know what I'm going to get out of this. Whereas they might be skeptical of a charity-based model or an NGO coming in and saying, I'm going to give you something for free, but in their experience, they found nothing is really free. Um, and so with this business model, we're able to stand out a bit and, and be very transparent with them about what they're getting. The way that LEAF works is that our revenue model is similar to a bank in that we're able to facilitate the investment of our customer savings. So during the time in transit where a refugee isn't using that money, we're able to go invest it regionally and we're seeing high returns. I mean, you're, you're talking six to 14% on savings, which in the US is unheard of, uh, but it allows us to be sustainable. And then we also do charge small transaction fees and create a positive foreign exchange spread when converting between currencies. But unlike a bank, we don't have the high cost of a fixed in, or a physical infrastructure. And not mention the mobile money networks that already exist in these areas. We're able to capitalize on that to offer services virtually. And so we do have uh, in-person customer support because we found that people always like to have that human touch point. But most of it, from a technology standpoint, can be done virtually. And so we're we're very early stage, but we expect to break even around 22,000 accounts. So far, we have done this, we've piloted in Rwanda and Congo. We've been on the ground there several times doing cross-border transactions um, and working with refugees and also small traders there on the border. These are people that are carrying goods across the border every day, just taking advantage of what's cheaper on one side than the other. And we found that they have a lot of similar financial needs to refugees, which I think was kind of surprising to us. Uh, but they're facing similar challenges, like being robbed by border guards and having to carry large sums of cash, losing value and exchange fees every day. And so they've been a very accessible group that's been fun to work with over the past six months. We've also tested a biometrics platform on the border there. We were a little bit nervous about this going in, you know, talking about technology and how we relate to that as humans. Were people going to be comfortable having their photo taken, um, having their voice recorded, having that linked to an account and not knowing where that information was going to be stored? 
But what we found was that people are actually very excited about this technology. Uh, we were looking for a handful of people to test this, and honestly, we asked for volunteers, and every hand in the room went up. Uh, they were thrilled. So it just goes to show, I think, people all over the world love, they love their Facebook, they love their WhatsApp, they love their picture taken. Not everybody, but um, you know, refugees are just like us. They're normal people, and I think that there's a bit of that new technology that's always a little exciting. So our next steps then are to get established in Rwanda and Congo. We uh, have some companies set up there and we'll be back very soon getting established. As you can imagine, the regulatory piece of this is really interesting. And so I think that's where Nat's background as a, uh, just graduated from law school comes into play. Uh, I passed the bar too, you, so you did. technically a lawyer. Yeah. yeah, no, that's going to help <laughs> us in East Africa, but yes. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so those are our next steps. But I, but I think that important to this whole discussion is, is the human aspect of this. There is no point in building a technology product that's going to provide services to a population that, as you said, doesn't, doesn't want it, doesn't understand it. And so I think this is where you know, my background worked personally with resettled refugees here in the U.S. for about 15 years and, and know just the incredibly high highs and low lows that this, this population walks through. Um, and as a provider of services to these people, whether it's financial, healthcare, education, whatever it is, I just think that you have to be so cognizant of that at every step along the way, whether it's the design process, customer support, whatever that looks like, um, knowing your population inside and out and keeping that human touch point in mind as you're designing services um, is going to be the only route to success, really, especially with this population. And so I, I guess I would ask at the end here, um, not mention that feeling of, of carrying everything you own and of, of the uncertainty that comes with being not only forced from your country and your way of life and your family and your community, but all of your assets. I mean, if you were to lose your life savings overnight, I think that would put all of us in a certain mental state. And so thankfully, that's not going to be the case for most of us in this room, but it, that is still the case for 68 million people around the world today. And so um, and we're glad that you're here, excited to have you engaged in this conversation. I think we look forward to taking your questions. Banji, Sylvia, um, Nate, and Tori in that order. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very informative but also very inspiring conversation. Um, I kind of feel that my hope has actually lifted quite a lot, even despite the, uh, the tremendous challenges. Uh, one of the questions that we raise with our project, Tech and the Human Spirit, is how can we steward technology to benefit human flourishing in all its dimensions? And that certainly includes the economics. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, how can I put this delicately? Uh, could I invite you to um, ask um, an elegantly concise question? <laughs> And if you have anything to say, I'm sure our panelists would be happy to, to engage, engage with you. Please raise your hand if you'd like to talk, and we'll pass the mics around. So I was just wondering if you could explain just a tiny bit more how you convert, how the refugees convert their cash into something that they can cross borders with. Sure. I don't sure. I just want sure. to yeah. a little and better. Definitely. And that's, I know it's a, a weird concept in, in the <laughs> U.S., but it's... Um, it's mobile money, so it's um, essentially as easy as sending a text message um, from your phone. You can um, go to an agent, um, which are, there are thousands of them in, in uh, many of these countries, where you can go to the corner store, exchange cash um, for this mobile money that's stored on your phone, and then send that um, through, your, through your phone. And it's um, becoming the predominant way of, of banking in many countries, certainly across uh, Africa, where it's growing a lot faster than bank accounts. So you don't have to go into a bank branch. Um, you can just use your, your mobile phone um, to make, make transactions. So that's already there, and that's been really growing um, fast in the last three to five uh, years, was pilot, you know, pioneered predominantly in, in Kenya um, as a way of, of transacting, and now is spreading to many other countries. So we're just tapping into that um, existing network. So there are already agents who are on the ground who are working with the mobile phone companies to do those cash to mobile money um, transactions. So we're already using that existing sort of behavior pattern um, that everyone's comfortable with. Um, and so screen for, for people who already have uh, mobile money accounts. There was a question at the back there. That they... Hi. Um, I have kind of, I promise they'll be short, like a, like a cluster of questions. Some of them are really simple. 
So the first and the second are to the folks from LEAF. Um, first, why don't existing virtual banking services work? You mentioned about the difficulty of crossing borders. So just from a non, someone who doesn't know much about that industry, why does that, what is, like, how does your service not fall into the problems that others have? Mm -hmm. Secondly, what are your plans and the feasibility of expanding beyond Central Africa? Because as you mentioned, Africa is kind of a special case given that there's already an established thing for yep. this. So like you mentioned, yep. you're screening for people who already have these services. What about expanding to Latin America, for example, yep. where there's not already a precedent yeah, exactly. like this? And then lastly, and this is to the uh, a question maybe for the Free Will Innovation Hub as well, and specifically for the folks from LEAF, what are you guys looking for from Santa Clara? Like what are you, do I just want to proceed like a, sort of like a bug in our ears to get us thinking about this stuff? Or, or <laughs> like, or, or is there like a, some kind of collaboration in the works, <laughs> yeah. et cetera? Absolutely, definitely. Um, I don't know. Do you want me you want to start take this? <laughs> okay, sure. I'll take. I can take the. I like the second one a, a lot. Take the first uh, you one. Take the first that one. So, good. so absolutely, we looked um, globally. So I, I recruited a, a group of uh, four grad students to go to six different countries two summers ago, um, and we sent a team to Cucuta on the border of uh, Venezuela and, and Colombia, and then also a team to Mexico to just talk to anyone that would want to talk to us to look at the market. So I think. What was surprising was how similar the challenge was in the, in the border of Venezuela and Colombia, and, as well as Congo and um, in Rwanda. Same challenges of converting cash, carrying cash, opening bank accounts, uh, lack of identity, um, and then same thing in um, Myanmar and, and Bangladesh. Uh, very similar challenge uh, crossing the borders. We also sent a team um, to Southeast Asia and then someone to Greece to interview Syrian refugees. So the goal of uh, LEAF, is why we're calling it LEAF Global uh, FinTech, is to absolutely to do that, to be able to be in a place where we can expand this globally um, to any of the conflict zones uh, around the world. We thought it might be easier, uh, I hope this is right, to start in East Africa <laughs> because of the um, regulatory environment and some of the mold money that's, um, that's there but absolutely looking to expand um, beyond, um, beyond East Africa. Well, and a lot of those other conflict zones do have similar mobile money systems as well. Um, so 60%. getting the model right in, in a slower burning crisis zone and then moving on. Um, to your point about banking and crossing borders. So what we find is that existing services fall into one of two camps. Either they are the domestic storage of assets, and that's like your banks and your mobile money operators. And a, a lot of the banks, frankly, won't serve refugees. Um, there's a very long history of that. And it's been interesting to see the idea permeate now as some of the banks will actually offer services. The refugees just have it in their heads. Well, I can't get a bank account. I can't be part of the formal financial system. They wouldn't say it that way, but, but that's the idea. Um, and so we see that side of things. Or what we see is point-to-point -point cash transfer, like Western Union and MoneyGram. And this is just terrible and fascinating and interesting um, for the refugee population that's receiving money from abroad, from the United States or Europe. Um, those transactions, you're losing up to 20% in fees. And, and it still leaves the refugee with cash at the end of the day. And so we see ourselves as different because we combine those two things, storage and transport of assets across borders, and then make it available on a feature phone. That's the final thing I think that's just really different. Any of your virtual banking services are completely dependent upon a smartphone. And so our, SS, or our SMS and USSD interface, just texting back and forth, um, makes it very accessible to the true bottom of the pyramid. And that last question, I think we've already got two wonderful experts on this panel yeah. that I hope we can continue <laughs> to work with. So we'd love to, to build that relationship with uh, Santa Clara and, of course, you know, with, with students, with faculty, with research. You're in the heart of, of Silicon Valley, and we have a very, you know, exciting new technology that we've been experimenting with, and very few people around the world understand it. So we would love uh, any and all the help that we can get from this community. I guess from our side, we educate, you know, Santa Clara students for for being people of service and for doing something, you know, good when they get out of here. And I think we need to really, I, I, at least it's my job in the Frugal Hub, to educate the students on the problems that we have, and this is a, a huge one currently, and get them engaged and show them that their skills are actually super useful to make it better. So last year, the last couple of years, I think, one third of the senior projects in the School of Engineering are all for social benefit. Yeah. So a lot of the engineering students are already engaged. And, and so are, you know, the students in the other colleges as well, in arts and science and in the business school. So having, you know, this awareness and having more and more students actually working for, you know, benefits of, you know, impoverished areas is uh, one of my goals. And, and I think it aligns really well with what we are doing as a and just yep. to plug, oh. put in a plug oh. for the law school, we have an entrepreneur's law clinic that supports nonprofits who are um, 
who, who are starting out and, and need some sort of legal services. And we have um, a tech edge program for students who are particularly interested in that. And we have some representatives from that program here today. Okay. There was a question oh. there. If they, I think you. Where are you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, this might have been an arrogant kind of question, you know. I agree the technology we want to use to minimize this misery. However, we got to look at how the technology can be used to minimize the misery. In fact, things are going opposite. The technology has been helping, giving those tools and instruments to cause more of this misery. Advances in armaments, advances in going out there, and the differences in those things. In fact, the modern technology is letting in the hands of those cruel tyranny and those things increasing. How can you minimize that? Could we take that uh, also the, the other question there? Um, you had a question? Oh, yeah. I was just curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on what the interaction between people and agents and refugees look like on the other side. Okay. The interaction between lead people and refugees on the other side. So um, it, just quickly, when a refugee needs to cash out, that's what I'm assuming you mean by the other side. Um, so they're, they've crossed into a new country and they're accessing their finances again. That's why we have the biometric profile, so they can lose their passport, get a new phone, and they still have access to their finances. And so they're able to establish contact with LEAF again through texting and say, hey, this is me. Um, we validate that with the facial recognition, vocal recognition, a password, and then we're able to disperse funds either to a new mobile money account or um, the World Food Program is doing a lot with the ATM cash cards, and so we're working with them to become a feeder into that system um, to ultimately make refugees less dependent upon aid agencies and host countries. So how do they get involved in the system? Mm. Like they find out about us, yeah. 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 Somewhat, um, and that's where I think our background comes in really handy. So we're very well connected within the resettled refugee community, and what we found is that communities fragmented by trauma tend to stay in very close contact with each other, and that relational trust is even more important than it is in any other community. And so we're working with the refugees here in the U.S. to advocate for LEAF services to their friends and family back home. Um, and so that's both establishing knowledge and trust. And that was something that, honestly, they offered to us long before we asked them to do that. We're completely humbled by that. Um, so reaching out to them through those established word of mouth networks and then also partnering with the most well-known and trusted brands in the region, which are the telecoms. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make an announcement, if and because we are just about drawing out to the end of our time. Um, uh, we're there. We've thank you very much for your questions about Santa Clara, and I'm delighted that we are able to host this. Uh, you'll see there uniting the uh, uniting igniting the flame of Jesuit education. Um, this last summer in Bilbao, in Spain, uh, Father Arturo Sosa. Uh, laid out a very important vision for Jesuit education. And I'd like to quote some of the things he said. Um, this means allowing ourselves to be moved by the cry of the millions of migrants seeking a better way of life, by the poor who seek justice, by those who have been denied their rights to participate democratically in public life. Jesuit universities are exceptionally effective platforms where we can put into practice the mission to foster social justice and environmental sustainability. A Jesuit university should be looking beyond its own walls and being present to the complex workings of history. The purpose of our thinking is revealed when learning contributes effectively to making the world a better place to live in. Uh, thank you very much for making the world a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talking of which, um, at the end of church, um, there are some announcements. Um, one of this is this Saturday uh, at um, five, from five to seven, uh, uh, there is a welcome reception uh, for the Social Entrepreneurship at the Margins uh, organization. The enterprises comprise the, this, this wonderful work of, the, of social uh, being a, so a social accelerator program. Um, these enterprises serve or are led by refugees, migrants, and human trafficking survivors. Um, it is where on Saturday? Charney. Charney Hall, thank you very much indeed. And I think, Aaron, you have one more announcement? Yes, our next event, sorry. Our next event is um, Father Dorian's Search for What, oh, Father Dorian's Search for What Matters. Um, 
event. So that'll be October 29th at, uh, in Lucas Hall. Um, and so that'll be the first of this year's Search for What Matters series, asking our, our speakers um, what matters to you and why. So we invite you to that event, um, and that's our next Bannon um, event. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Very much.